Okay, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing and being able to come together that we may study your word. We pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom and understanding as we uh, study this topic and may uh, your word be clear and provide uh, clarity uh, on this difficult subject. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Come sooner. Thank you for you. All right. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Let's see. Tongues known but unknown. That was a nice catchy title. <laughs> uh, hold on one second. Nice. All right. There we go. All right, um, Pastor and uh, Andrew, you guys have co-host control, so in case somebody comes in and I don't, I just happen not to see it, uh, uh, just let them in. You gave me co-host controls, or is it? I did, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, and then put this full screen. All right, so tongues, known but unknown, and as I promised, we are going to uh, break down First uh, Corinthians chapter fourteen. All right, so um, let's get into it. I love that on Sabbath we study the Bible and we get into the word and it's just amazing with friends and stuff. I love it. Amen. Amen to that. All right. So in order to understand um, the passage in question, first Corinthians, uh, we need to understand a little bit of context. Sometimes people misinterpret things because it's taken out of context. So they may not even know or understand the context uh, for a given passage. So uh, the book of First Corinthians is, is, is named Corinthians because it's a letter from Paul to the, church, to the church at Corinth. And so it helps to understand something about the culture and the context of the church of Corinth in order to understand the, the church of the Corinthians. Um, so the Corinthian church was, found, was founded by Paul. They, uh, some scholars estimate about three years prior to his letter being written. Uh, the practice of babbling and having obscure random interpretations was a practice used in paganism long before Christianity and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So this idea where somebody will be like, blah, 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 and then somebody else will be like, oh, he said, blah, 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 blah. Uh, that's been something that has been going on in paganism, uh, you know, uh, in, in Greece and in many different cultures and, 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 and countries. So that was not the gift of tongues. Uh, for example, the Oracle of Delphi used this exact practice in which she would fall into a trance and then use static utterances loosely, uh, loosely interpreted by someone else in, uh, in, in ambiguous ways. So they would make the interpretation ambiguous enough where you know virtually the person could have been saying anything. So this was a Greek religion that existed prior to the advent of the Roman Empire in the time of Christ. So remember, Christianity doesn't begin until after the advent of the Roman Empire and after, of course, the, the, the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ. So if this practice of the, or, or the, oracle, of the oracle of Delphi with these ecstatic utterances and then interpreting them loosely was an occurrence long before uh, the advent of the Roman Empire and certainly long before Christ, how could it possibly be um, the gift of a spirit, the gift of the spirit, prior to the Holy Spirit uh, and and His outpouring at Pentecost? Uh -oh. And of course, the answer is it can't. It's a pagan practice that came into Christianity and kind of obscured the truth about the real gift of tongues. Now, the Corinthian church was a melting pot of people from all over the Roman Empire. It was a seaport. There were slaves that were, that were living there that were serving the Romans and the Greeks from, uh, from all over the world. They converted many of them to Christianity. In the church, because it was a seaport uh, comparable to modern day uh, Vallejo or San Francisco, when, when one would be walking up and, and, and down the streets, there were, there were a variety of people speaking different languages simultaneously. So there was no like one set um, language for that particular place. Uh, they spoke many languages because you know the seaport brings in people from all over the place. Um, so naturally, um, there are people who 
you know, would, would speak entirely different languages and not be able to understand each other. All right, so let's get into 1 Corinthians. I'm actually going to go back and forth between the slides and uh, scripture, uh, but we're going to mainly be in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. All right, so let me just increase the size of this so you guys can read along with me. All right, so we're going to start with verses 1 and 2. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. So let's examine verses one and two. Mm. One of the things that you'll notice here, if, if you look at my Bible, you'll see how the word unknown is written in like kind of a grayed out italics format. You see this? Yes, that's true. That's because the word unknown is not in the original text. It's supplied by the translators who assumed it should go there. So there is no such thing biblically as an unknown tongue. The word unknown is not in the Greek. It's not in the original language. So this passage is actually, I think, more correctly translated in the new King James Version, which I'll put on screen just for a second. Just give me a moment to grab it. So that's 1 Corinthians 14, and we'll go to verse 1. Um, so you'll see here where it says, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak unto, uh, to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mystery. So you'll notice that there, the word unknown does not appear in the passage because it's not in the original Greek. So the New King James Version actually translates it more, more correctly. And that brings us back to our slide here. So the passage says, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, some people just take this, this verse and they run with it. And they say, oh, well, see, a person who's speaking in an unknown tongue or, 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 or a tongue that's not of this world is speaking to God. But that's not what the passage is trying to say. And we're going to look at this passage a lot closer and understand what Paul was actually trying to communicate here. So I'll read it one more time and let's focus on what he's trying to say. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Let's break this down. First of all, the phrase used here is in the singular form, a tongue which means a language of many kinds. So when you, a person speaks in a tongue, they're speaking in a language uh, that is one language among many different kinds of language. So this passage isn't saying that the person speaks in tongues. It's saying that the, pe that the person speaks in a tongue amongst many different kinds of tongues or languages. Another thing that becomes confusing about this passage is the use of the word spirit. Every time the Bible uses the word spirit, people just take it and run with it and go in all kinds of different directions. But there's something that we've talked about many times when we've done Bible study together. The term spirit can also be translated what? As breath. As breath. As breath. So in his breath, the individual is speaking uh, mysteries that no one can understand because he is speaking in a language not understood by those present. So it's not saying that he's in the spirit or in a spiritual trance or in a spiritual something, right? And therefore he's speaking mysteries. That's not what the passage is saying. He's saying in his breath, as, he's, as words are coming out of his mouth into the air, as his breath is, is communicating sound and language, He's speaking mysteries because nobody understands them. So the reason Paul says the person is speaking to God and not to men is specifically because no one understands him. So in the Greek, you see this word for, 
that's right here. In the Greek, the word for basically means because. So let's look at this. For or because he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for or because no one understands him. Now the passage is starting to make a lot more sense. So in other words, the, per the passage is not saying that if you speak in an unknown tongue, you're speaking to God and that nobody understands you because you're speaking to God. That's not what the, what the, what the passage or the original language say at all. Instead, the passage is saying that when you, a person speaks in a tongue or in a language, they're not speaking to, to men, they're speaking to God because no one understands him. So Paul's basically being facetious here. He's saying, hey, if nobody understands what you're saying, you must be talking to God because otherwise nobody else knows what you're saying. So maybe God understands, but nobody else does. So he's actually in a way kind of mocking uh, that practice because if, if you're in a room and you're talking and nobody hears or understands what you're saying, whether you're speaking in French or Spanish or English or whatever the language might be, only God understands you, so you can only talk to God because you can't talk to anyone else since they don't understand what you're saying. So Paul was very clear about, about that point. So going back to this, the reason Paul says that the person is speaking to God and not to men is specifically because, remember the word for can be translated because, no one understands him. He does not indicate here that the intent was to speak to God, but that the result was speaking to God because only God understands. That's, this verse is probably one of the main reasons why a lot of people misinterpret this passage in 1 Corinthians 14, because they think they, they don't understand the causality. So he's, the passage isn't saying that the person is speaking in a, in, a, in a language intending to speak to God. He's saying that because nobody understands what this individual is saying, that he might as well be speaking to God or, he, or the result is, is that he, end up, is he ends up speaking to God because nobody else understands what he's talking about. And then finally, Paul seems to be using irony to describe the futility of speaking in an unknown language. Also note, uh, the Greek does not say he who speaks in an unknown, uh, in an unknown tongue. The passage implies that the language spoken is unknown by those present but there is no such thing as an unknown tongue. So nowhere in scripture is there ever this phrase, unknown tongue. It never appears in scripture. You see it in the King James Version, but you'll always see it in italics, the, the word unknown in italics, because it's not in the original Greek. So there is no such thing, biblically, as an unknown tongue. Now, the author correctly supplies the word unknown because the tongue or language was obviously not known to those in the room, and therefore could not be understood. In that sense, it's unknown. But he wasn't saying that the, that, the, that the language was unknown to human beings. So it was a known language, but unknown to those present. It's kind of like if uh, somebody were to come over and, and join our, our Bible study from, let's say, from India, and they spoke Punjab, right? Does anybody here speak Punjab? Now, Punjab is a known language, right? It's a real known language that they speak over in India, but it's unknown to us in that we don't understand it. So in that sense, it's unknown, not unknown to human beings. So this is what the passage is talking about, how a person could join the church, uh, but speak in a language that those present wouldn't know. And so it's unknown to them, even though it's a known language in the world. Uh, so what was spoken was a tongue, meaning one of many kinds. So there's no such thing as a unknown tongue, but rather it's a tongue, meaning a language that is one of many kinds. Spanish, um, French, Italian, Greek, et cetera, et cetera. The specific language was not specified in this passage because the larger point was that any language spoken and not understood would be the equivalent of speaking to God. So in other words, if I walk into a church and everybody in that church speaks either Italian or Spanish and I start talking in English, well, guess what? I'm speaking in a tongue that's unknown to everybody who's there. 
And the only person in that church I could talk to would be God. Why? Because if nobody there speaks English, I can't communicate with them. Okay. So let's pause I there. For that, a I just want to yeah. say that <clears throat> I think tongues are harder to un interpret and they're not given the gift of supernatural innate tongues are not given, you know, so frequent and abundant by God. So I think the fact of the matter that that is the case and also that um, it's so easy to be a foreigner when it comes to a tongue because of Babylon, because of the Tower of Babel. There's so many different languages. There's thousands of languages and not all of them. The Bible talks about that all of them are significant. So but that also that there's so many tongue languages, but it's so easy to be a foreigner with a tongue. And I've been like, for instance, I've been studying Spanish since 1996 or seven. I think it was summer of night, uh, fall of 1996 when I started, when I first got introduced to it, but I still don't know it very well. I can't speak it fluently. I can understand it better than I can speak it, but, and I don't know, I can write it, but it's hard to under, it's hard to spell it because the, the, because the phonetics are different. So, and the alphabet is different. So, um, it's interesting that, and they have more characters in the Spanish alphabet. So, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's, I can't, I still can't speak it fluently. I can't understand it fluently by no means. So um, it's interesting that it's harder, it's easier to be a foreigner when it comes to tongue. So it's, so what God asked us to do is, you know, speak in a known tongue as best we can. Yeah. Known to people in the room. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th there is no such thing. And this passage is not referring to what people think is a heavenly language. There's no such thing. Um, so this passage is, is talking about known languages, but in the church of Corinth, which was a seaport church, somebody could come in not speaking the, a language that was known to the people in the room. And because it was unknown to them, they um, would, be, would be speaking to God basically because nobody else in the room would be able to understand what they're saying. So when, when they pray, God would know what they're saying, but nobody else would be able to say amen because they don't understand what's being said. Okay, so that, that's the main point uh, from verses one to two. And what's interesting, what I, what I found in studying this out is that Paul is not necessarily or specifically talking about the gift of, 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 of tongues, right? This, what he, what, he, what he spells out in 1 Corinthians 14 is a general rule whether a person speaks in another language by the gift or whether they naturally speak in another language. That's an interesting point that most people miss about this passage. So in other words, in this passage, he is not assuming that the person speaks in a tongue or in a language through supernatural means. And as we go through this passage, it'll become even more clear. All right. So the first thing I want to make sure that we all understand here is that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2, the word tongue is in singular form, right? So tongue is singular. Tongues with an S at the end would be plural. In this case, the word tongue is in the singular form, and it's, for, and it's uh, preceded by the, uh, by the indefinite article, a. Uh. So we're talking about a tongue, right? A tongue or one tongue. Now, if a person speaks in a tongue, what does that mean? I think a known tongue, tongue right? Yeah, it would have to be a known tongue. Like it would be, have to be a known language that is it one of many different kinds of language. Notice that the passage doesn't say if a person speaks in the tongue. Because if you say the tongue, then now you're talking about a specific language. But instead, it says a tongue, meaning that it's a kind of tongue or one kind of, that, are, that are of many kinds, many known languages. So I just thought we could make that point very clear. All right, let's move on to the next part. Uh, there's, a second, there's a second singular use uh, if you take a look at verses three and four. So let's take a look at that next. We're going to look at verses three and four. And again, you see the singular use of the word tongue. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. 
He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So here again, you see that the person speaks in a tongue. In other words, a language amongst many different kinds of language. Welcome, Camilla. Glad you could join us. Thank you. Same to you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. <laughs> Thanks. So this person speaks in a tongue or a language among many different kinds of language. And there again, I'm just going to point it out with my mouse here. You can see the singular use of the word tongue followed by the indefinite article a. So it's a tongue or a language that obviously are one among many. It's kind of like if I say, I have a dog, right? I have one dog, right? But uh, that dog is one dog among many different kinds of dogs or many different uh, uh, people who have dogs. You know, if I go to a church, right? Then I go to one church that's one church among many different kinds of churches or many different locations that have churches. So that's kind of the same thing that we're seeing here. When he says a tongue, it implies that there are more than one. Mm -hmm. because if there was only one type of tongue then he would have said the tongue but he doesn't say that he says a tongue which implies it's one language among many different kinds of language okay and you'll see the significance of that as, as we move forward trust me um so basically let's let's look at the passage itself all right so now we understand that he's talking about one language but let's let's look at the passage again but he who, who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So he's basically saying here that when a person prophesies, they're able to benefit other people around them. When a person speaks in a tongue or in a language, he's only edifying or benefiting himself compared to the person who prophesies, who's edifying the entire church. So when a person speaks in a language, and obviously it's a language that others don't know because nobody else understands it, right? Um, they're not benefiting anybody. The benefit comes only when other people speak that language. So prophesying is a benefit to everyone because it can be understood. Everybody knows what you're saying. They all hear it. They all get it. Again, the singular form is used here speaking in a tongue, and this only edifies the individual person. And again, uh, there's no indication here that he's necessarily talking about the gift, uh, but, but language in general, which may be uh, as a result of the gift or not. So either way, it wouldn't really matter. But now Paul does something interesting. In verses two, three, and four, he twice used the singular form of the word tongue. In verses five, sorry, in verse five, he uses the plural ver version of the, of the word tongue. So in this passage, he switches between the singular use and the plural use. So first he goes from talking about a tongue, and then he goes into talking about with tongues, plural. Let's take a look at verse five. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So what do you guys notice here? How many languages is he talking about? Tongues are for edification of the church. Right, but how many languages is he talking about? More than more one. Than one. More than one, right? So in verses two, three, and four, he was only talking about one language. Let's we'll review that real quick. Um, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Um, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But now he's using the plural form. I wish you all spoke with tongues. So now he's talking about multiple languages. In other words, he's saying, I wish you all spoke multiple languages. And think about it, in a church like Corinth that was at a seaport, speaking multiple languages would be awesome and totally uh, useful for that particular church congregation because they got visitors from all over the world. 
if they all spoke in multiple languages, it would be of great benefit because then there wouldn't be any confusion. It would be easy to communicate with one another. But that wasn't the case at Corinth. So he said, I wish you all spoke with tongues, plural. I, I wish you all spoke with many languages, but even more that you prophesied. So while it would be a bit of great benefit that they spoke with many languages, Paul says, hey, it would be even better if you prophesied. Why, Paul? Notice the word here again, for. What does the word for mean? Because. Because. So here's why he wished they all spoke with languages, but even more that they prophesied. Here's why. Because he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues. Hmm. So it's better to prophesy than to speak with multiple languages. Unless, indeed, he interprets that the church may receive edification. So in other mm -hmm. words, if you can speak with multiple languages, but nobody understands any of them, then the church doesn't benefit from it. It's cool that you can speak multiple languages, but nobody's, nobody's benefiting from it. So in other words, let's say God randomly blesses me with the ability to speak Italian, Spanish, uh, I don't know, Hebrew, Greek, and Swahili. And I go into church and I start talking in all those languages. Is anybody blessed by it? Not if they can't understand it. Exactly. So it's cool. I could speak multiple languages, but if nobody understands any of them other than English, then me being able to speak with multiple languages does nobody any good other than me. So yeah. he says, he that prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues or languages, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. And he says this because the church can't be edified or blessed if they don't understand what the person said. It's like, okay, he looked like he was pretty. You ever see somebody talk and like they're getting really excited about what they're saying, but nobody understands what they're saying except them? <laughs> pretty interesting like uh you know i, I remember in in, uh, in high school we used to have this teacher and sometimes he would get really excited about stuff but sometimes if the class was like tuning out he would be all excited and into what he was saying but nobody understood what he was talking about except him so nobody the class wasn't edified he was teaching trying to get us prepared for the regents i guess but it wasn't to edification because nobody was learning anything if we didn't understand what he was saying That's what Paul's talking about here. Speaking with tongues or languages is only beneficial if somebody can interpret those languages that the church may receive blessing or edification. And notice here, he's not just talking about one language because if he was saying one language, he would have said he who speaks in a tongue, but he didn't say that here. He who speaks with tongues, plural. In other words, he who speaks with languages, even though it's a interesting ability, even though it's a uh, even though it's, it's it's a great thing to be able to do, nobody's edified by it if they don't understand any of these tongues plural. So Paul here uses the plural form for the first time. Prior to this verse, he was he was using only the singular form. He wishes the congregation spoke with languages plural. Prophecy. He then says it's better because it can, it can be understood by everyone. Unless when a person speaks with a language, an interpretation is provided. Note that the phrase is not speak in tongues, right? The passage doesn't say speak in tongues. So he who speaks in tongues, because that would imply, oh, the person is speaking in many tongues or many languages or maybe in some kind of mysterious language that's made up of many languages. That's not what the passage says. So the passage doesn't ever say speak in tongues, but it says speak with tongues, plural. So when we compare verses two and, and uh, you know, two through, two through four, those passages say speak in a tongue. So there are two phrases here, here used for, for, the, for, for the gift of tongues, right? You have the, the phrase, speak in a tongue, meaning speak in a language. 
And then you have the phrase speak with tongues, meaning speak with languages, implying that there's more than one language that can be spoken with. Okay, so hopefully that right, that right there is enough to clear up a lot of misconception and confusion. There's no such thing as speaking in tongues. You're either speaking in a tongue, meaning a single language, or you're speaking with tongues, meaning you're speaking with multiple languages. Right? Any, uh, anything you guys want me to clear up? Any, any uh, confusion so far before I move on? Okay, good. <laughs> Feel free to stop me anytime if this gets confusing because some parts um, get a little bit technical. All right, so we've looked so far at um, the use of, of the phrase tongues in verses one to five. Twice he uses the phrase in, in a tongue and, and the, in verse five he uses the phrase uh, speaking with tongues, plural. Yeah. So there's a singular version and then there's a plural version. And what you're gonna start seeing is that because he's using the singular form of the word tongue and the plural form in the same passage, he cannot possibly be talking about a heavenly language. And that is not what's intended by the passage to communicate. First Corinthians chapter 10, sorry, chapter 12, verse 10 says, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. Then I'll skip down to verse 28. And God had set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. So these, these, these two passages in 1 Corinthians are Paul's description of the gifts of the Spirit. And he's talking about how the Holy Spirit distributes these gifts and gives different people these spiritual gifts. And when he gets to the part about tongues, notice what he does. He describes the gift of tongues as diverse kinds of tongues. What does that mean? Different, different kinds of tongues. Mm -hmm. Which would mean languages. Different, languages. Different, different languages. That's right, different languages. Now, if there was only one type of tongue, right, then a person could say, well, hey, it's this heavenly language, right? It, it would say in this passage that, that instead of saying diverse kinds of tongues, it would say something like, and speaking in heavenly tongues or something like that. But that's not what the passage says here. The passage describes that there are diverse kinds of tongues, meaning that there are different kinds of languages. That's what the gift of tongues was all about. It wasn't about speaking in an in a unknown heavenly language to communicate only with God but rather it was about speaking in different known human languages to communicate with other people that you could not previously communicate with or share the gospel with. And in Acts chapter two, you see that where what did the apostles receive the ability to do, to do once the Holy Spirit was poured out on them? Speak in tongues. Right. And when they went out and they began to speak with those, with those tongues or with those languages, were people able to understand what they were saying? Yes. Yes, they were. In fact, they knew exactly what they were saying. They said, we, we do hear them speak the wonderful works of God. So they knew what the apostles were saying. So the gift wasn't about speaking in some unknown tongue, but rather was about speaking in diverse kinds of languages. So that's very clear from verse 10. Looking at verse 28, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, going back to verse 10, I, I forgot to mention, it says to another interpretation of tongues. So one gift was to be able to speak in different kinds of languages, right? The other gift was to be able to interpret um, other languages that you had not previously learned. Which is even harder. Yeah. Now going to verse, 20, to verse 28, notice it says here, that uh, you know, there are miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Again, it's showing you that it's not just one type of tongue, but that there are diversities of tongues. In other words, there are diverse languages. 
different dialects, different languages, different ways of speaking, communicating. So it's not talking about a heavenly language. It's talking about <laughs> being able to speak different languages that the person had not previously learned before. Everybody see that in those two passages? Mm -hmm. So in both these passages, the gift of tongues is described as diverse or different kinds of tongues or languages. So the gift isn't being able to speak in a language that nobody else on earth knows. The gift is being able to speak in different kinds of languages without having to actually go to school and learn them. Showing that this is how Paul understood the gift. Because he could have described it as a heavenly language, but he doesn't. He could have described it as speaking in some kind of joined together language, but he doesn't describe it that way. He's very specific that there are different kinds of languages. So that's how Paul understood the gift of tongues. And that's how he's writing in 1 Corinthians. The ability to speak in other languages and also to understand those who speak in these languages. That's the gift of interpretation. Oh, let me just plug that in. Hold on a second. There we go. Okay, so we move forward with that. Now, we know that these different kinds of tongues or different kinds of languages were understood by believers and unbelievers who were present. So what some people will do is they'll say, oh, well, they were speaking in this heavenly language, but God gave the ability uh, to, to, the, to the listeners to understand them. If that were the case, then the spiritual gift would be the gift of ears, not the gift of tongues, because it would mean that the person hearing gets to understand something that nobody else can understand. But the Bible doesn't call it the gift of ears, it's the gift of tongues, meaning that the, that the person who, who the miracle happens for is the individual who is speaking. As they are speaking with this gift of tongues, they're able to speak in, in, um, in, in, in multiple different languages. And they are able to be understood by the people present who hear them. So the miracle is not happening for the individual who's hearing, the miracle is happening through the person who's speaking. So let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Plural. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, what the Spirit gave to the apostles was the ability to speak in other tongues or languages. And these words were considered utterances. You see that word utterance that's right there in the, in the passage? These were utterances given to them by the Spirit. These are not groanings or expressions that could not be uttered. So you'll remember, I think uh, once Lance had brought up this point about Romans chapter 8, verse 26. I'll just go there really quickly just for, for the sake of context, right? Romans 8, 26. And it says, likewise, the spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Right? So if the spirit is interceding with groans which cannot be uttered, what's a groan? The word could also be translated sigh. What's a groan or a sigh? It's like a moaning. Yeah, it's like a moan. Like, oh, right? So the spirit intercedes with groanings, not words, but groanings, which cannot be uttered. Now, if we go back to that other passage, right? Let's look at, um, at this passage again. When they were filled with the spirit, they began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. So could these things that the spirit was giving them be uttered? Yes. Whereas in Romans 8, 26, when the spirit intercedes, the spirit is the one groaning and he's groaning with expressions that cannot be uttered. So what's the difference between Acts chapter two, verse four and Romans 8, 26?
in one passage, the person is speaking with words and the spirit gives them the ability to utter these words. In Romans 8, 26, the spirit is the one who's doing the groaning and sighing, not talking, not, not expressing words, but groanings and sighings. And these expressions cannot be uttered. So are we talking about the same gift here? You guys are quiet. I hope, I'm hoping you guys are following me here. I was instructed. <laughs> no worries. All right, Not so really, but I, I read the tongues every single day. All right, I'll try to go through it again. All right, Acts chapter 2, verse 4 says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, they were uttering things and they began to speak with other tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them the ability to utter these things. Now in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, you see something different. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings. So in Acts chapter 2, you hear people speaking. In Romans chapter 8, it's not speaking, it's groaning or sighing. And it says, with groanings which cannot be uttered. So according to this passage, these groanings or sighings cannot be uttered. But in the other passage in, in Acts chapter 2, the people are speaking as the Spirit gives them utterance. So in this passage, they're able to utter something, whereas in Romans chapter 8, the groanings cannot be uttered. So are we talking about the same thing here? Are we talking about the same gift? No. No. Here, the spirit is doing the communicating and he's groaning. Here, the person is able to speak and they have utterance and they're speaking words. They're not speaking groanings. So we're talking about two entirely different things here. So Lance, I think, used this passage uh, the other week saying, well, maybe the utterances in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 are this heavenly language that the person gets the ability to speak. But that's not what the passage says. In Romans 8, 26, the utterances or groan, are, are, uh, sorry, the, the, the utterances, there, there are no utterances. There, there are only these groanings, which the, which the human being cannot utter. Whereas in Acts chapter two, verse four, the person is indeed speaking with languages as the spirit gives them the ability to do so and utter. Mm -hmm. So there is no such thing as a heavenly language. The passages don't really allow for that. In one passage, we're talking about the spirit groaning. In another passage, we're talking about people speaking. So we're talking about two entirely different things here. And those passages cannot be used to support one another. It's interesting that... Um... There's a guy that he's my teacher and he said he he used to speak heavy accent. He was heavy accent. He was a foreigner for sure. And he used to speak and teach me and he taught me statistics and he's, and I didn't understand hardly anything he said, but how did I get a, like a B in his class? Well, it was because I read the book <laughs> and <laughs> the book was clear, a lot clearer than his words. Sometimes it happens that way. And he, he was just teaching basically the book. Amen. <laughs> Glad you glad you uh, learned something from the book. <laughs> All right, Acts chapter two, verse eleven. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues, in our tongues, the wonderful works of God. So were they speaking in unknown heavenly languages? No. Yes, the Greeks. Nope. Well, well, I'll rephrase the question: Were they speaking in unknown heavenly languages? No, no. According to this, all these different languages they were speaking, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongue. So they were speaking in the languages of human beings. And what were they saying? The wonderful works of God. They, the people who were listening understood exactly what those disciples were saying. So is this the ability to speak in some unknown heavenly language? No. no. 
This was the ability to speak in known languages, our tongues or our languages. And they could understand that the communication was the wonderful works of God. So they could understand the word and understand and believe in Jesus. That's right. That was the purpose of the gift. Acts chapter 10, verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues, plural there, tongues, and magnify God. Question. How did they know that these people were magnifying God if they didn't understand them? Because they could have been saying anything. But yet, they understood enough to know that the individuals were magnifying God. So in these cases, unbelievers and believers heard and understood what was being said. So again, there is no such thing as a gift of tongues in which people do not understood, understand what's being, what's being said because it's some heavenly language. If they don't understand it, it's because they don't speak the language that's being spoken, but it's still an earthly human language. Okay, let me go ahead and move forward. All right. Now I wanted to give you guys uh, solid evidence that the word tongues can be translated language just in case anybody had any doubts. I'm going to go through this slide really quickly. This is just to show you how the word tongues is used in scripture and that clearly it refers to languages, like known human languages. So the word tongues is just another another word for language. Revelation chapter 10, verse 11. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. What did he mean? Prophesy before many people and nations and tongues and kings were they supposed to physically go in front of someone's tongue and prophesy to it what do they mean by tongues here the bible nope well they were supposed to be using the bible so it says Mm -hmm. here you must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues Think about it. What does he mean by tongues here? Where were they supposed to go? To the nations. That's right. They were talking about the languages of other people. So they had to go to many different kinds of people from many different places, many different nations who spoke many different languages and had kings. So this passage uses the word tongues, but here it's meant to be languages. Let's read it again. But this time, instead of saying tongues, I'll say languages. And you can tell me if you think it makes sense. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Right. So the word tongues means languages. Let's look at Revelation 11, verse 9. And, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put into graves. Okay? So they of of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations. What does tongues mean there? Same thing. Yep, same thing. Different languages. Revelation 13, verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. What does tongues mean there? Languages. Languages. So power was given to him over all kindreds and languages and nations. In other words, people who speak different languages. Revelation 17, verse 15. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. What does tongues mean there? (laughs) Languages. Revelation 14, verse 6, three angels' message. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So when the gospel is supposed to go to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people, what does it mean, every tongue? Mm-hmm. I to mean speaking the language yes. of the nation. Yes. 
So every, the gospel must go to people who speak all the different kinds of languages that there are. That's why we have the Bible translated into many different kinds of languages. Revelation 16, verse 16. And he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now, when it says in the Hebrew tongue, what are we talking about? A specific language. Yes, a specific language, the Hebrew language. Acts chapter 26, verse 14. And when, and when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So mm -hmm. when Jesus stopped uh, Saul of Tarshish on the road, he was speaking to him in the Hebrew what? Tongue language. Yes, the Hebrew language. So it's very, very clear that the word tongues uh, isn't referring to some heavenly language, but is referring to an earthly language. And that the word tongues itself means language. So every time, I mean, scripture uses the, the word tongues, but we can use the word language uh, for, for a clearer understanding. So every time we see the word tongues, all it means is language, as we saw in many of these passages. And this is by no means a, a complete list. This is just a few examples I gave you just to make the point. So let's go back a, a second. And, and, um, and, the, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Acts chapter 2, verse 11. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our languages the wonderful works of God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It should. Acts chapter 10, verse 46. For they heard them speak with languages and magnify God that uh then of course Peter gives his uh discourse um so when we go back now to first Corinthians chapter 14 inserting the word language where we see the word tongue helps things to make a lot more sense for he who speaks in a language does not speak to men but to God because or for no one understands him however in the breath or spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a language edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with languages, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with languages, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Now the passage, hopefully, should start making a lot more sense to you. It might also help if we look at what was it that Jesus promised was going to happen at Pentecost. Mark mm -hmm. chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name they shall cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues plural mm -hmm. they shall take up serpents and if they drink anything deadly sorry if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them they shall uh lay hands on the sick and they shall recover yeah notice here that the word tongues is plural so they're supposed to learn to speak with new languages. Is that what happened at Pentecost? Mm -hmm. Yes. So even Jesus mm -hmm. himself, when he talked about this gift that was to come, he didn't tell them that they were going to speak in some heavenly language. He told them that they were going to speak in new languages. Now, he didn't yeah, mean that God study. was going to invent new languages, but the word new here actually refers to meaning new to the people who are using it. And so in other words, there were no languages, that, right? but they were, they were learning languages that they had never learned before, Spanish and Greek and, and so forth. And you can know that by Acts chapter 2, it talks about that he, they heard it in the language of those people. Right. So the people didn't receive the gift of ears. The miracle was performed through the people who were speaking. And the, speak, and the people were speaking with different languages. 
and the people who heard them recognize those languages yeah. and and realize what they were saying and they were questioning wait how can these people how can these galileans speak in languages that we understand that was the gift so it's not that they were speaking in some gibberish and all of a sudden the people were magically able to hear them or and understand what they were saying it was that they were speaking in all these different languages and the people present were able to recognize their native languages and understand what the apostles and disciples were saying. That's the gift of tongues. And it's proof because notice that the word tongues here is plural. So how many languages were they speaking in? More than one. More than one. Now let's look at God's promise in the Old Testament. Okay, so we know that Jesus said that they were supposed to be able to speak in new languages, right? And that's what we saw happen in Acts chapter two. But what about God's promise in the Old Testament? Isaiah chapter 28, verse nine through 11. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue, singular, will he speak to this people. So according to the Old Testament prophecy, God was going to speak to his people with stammering lips and another tongue, singular. Now, in the Septuagint, which is the LXX, which, which, you, which you see on my screen. In the Greek, it translates uh, where it says um, another tongue. The Greek literally translates a foreign language. So the Greek is glosa hetera. That's, that, those are the Greek words that are used in that passage. Glosa hetera. Now, the term stammering lips was also a term used to refer to speech of foreigners because it was unrecognizable to the people listening. So essentially what's being used here in verse 11 is a hyperbole, it's an overstatement. It wasn't that they were speaking in stammering lips literally, meaning that um, the lips were li literally stammering and almost seeming randomized, but rather because the, pe the people who were being spoken to would not understand it, to them, the speech was stammering. Now, if you look at Isaiah 33, verse 19, you'll notice the same phrase used. Thou shalt not see a fierce people, a people of deeper speech than thou canst perceive, of a stammering tongue that thou canst not understand. So notice here in Isaiah 33, verse 19, God wasn't referring to people who literally were stammering, but rather he was talking about a foreign language. It was, it was called a stammering tongue because they were of deeper speech than could be perceived by the listener. That's why he refers to it as stammering speech. So in other words, the people weren't literally stammering, but when you're listening to a person talk a, a foreign language and you have no idea about the content of that language, to you, the speech is stammering because you can't understand it. So the, the promise was that God was going to speak to his people using the languages of foreigners. Is that what happened in Acts chapter 2? No. Yes. Yes. That's exactly what God did. He spoke to his people, to the Jewish people, in the, in the tongues of foreigners. Why? Because during the, um, when the Jews were, 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 were um, well, first it was the Israelites, when, when they were annexed by the, uh, by the Assyrians, they were driven to foreign locations. When the Jews were annexed from, uh, from Israel uh, or from Judah and, and um, sent to Babylon, they too uh, were, were spoken to by foreigners. And when, you're when they didn't understand the language of the Babylonians or the Assyrians, to them, their speech was crude or, or stammering because it was foreign to them. And they had to actually learn these languages. Now, when we go back to, or we go forward to the book of Acts, God gave his people 
the ability to learn these foreign languages so that they so that they could speak to the Jewish people in the foreign tongues of the nations where they had been driven to. That is what the purpose of the gift of tongues was, to fulfill this prophecy, to speak to God's people in the foreign tongues where they had been driven to. If they had not been driven out of Israel, then they would have all spoke Hebrew. There would have been no need for the gift of tongues because everybody who spoke Hebrew would have been present in, in, you know, in their homeland and God could have spoken to them as he normally does. But because they were spread out throughout the nations as a result of their disobedience, God would have to speak to them with stammering lips and another tongue, or in other words, a foreign tongue. So right here in Isaiah chapter 28, the term that's used here for another, another tongue is hetera glosa or glosa hetera, which means a foreign language. That's what that phrase means. So the prophecy indicates that the gift of tongues that would come in the New Testament was not a heavenly language, but rather a foreign language. That's what the prophecy says. Okay. Going to move forward. Now, the New Testament also uses this term heteroglossa. In the law, it is written, this is, this is all from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 21. Uh, Paul writes, in the law, it is written, with men, of other, uh, with, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. And yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. That's right there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 21. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, 21, he's actually quoting from Isaiah 28. And he uses the term or the phrase heteroglossoi. This is simply a contracted form of glossa hetera. You know how we do in English, I'll, I'll give you a similar expression. Like in English, we have the word don't, right? The word don't is a contracted form of do not. Or if I, if I were to say to you, um, they'll. They'll is the contracted form of they will. Mm -hmm. in, this in this case, heteroglossoi is the contracted form of heteroglossa or glossa hetera. So in other words, when Paul says, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, all he's saying is, with people, uh, with men of, of foreign language, will I speak to this people. There is nothing in this passage which suggests that Paul was telling them that they were going to receive an ability to speak in some heavenly tongue. Instead, this phrase simply means a foreign language, not an entirely different kind of language. So from the Old Testament, God had predicted that he was going to speak to his people and try to reach them with foreign languages. And this would be the case because they were, they were annexed from the land of Israel. And in the New Testament, Paul, quoting from these Old Testament passages, tells them the exact same thing and therefore explains why they have the gift of tongues, because God was going to speak to them in foreign languages, the languages of the lands where they had been driven to, in order to reach them and draw them back. So they could be reached, so they could be saved by Jesus. Exactly. Now, uh, before I move on, I should probably pause. All right, so is anybody confused about anything or, or uh, anything about this maybe confusing and you guys need me to explain it a little bit more? Or do you guys think you're following? I wanna make sure I'm not losing anybody. I think I'm blessed. I'm just waiting for the Lord to return. He's going to incline to me and he's going to come soon. So uh, I just want Jesus to come like now, but he's not going to. But I know he's waiting for those that haven't accepted him yet to accept him that will. But, you know, I, I know he is still waiting and I'm still waiting, but in faith. So, but I think that I understand tongues pretty good, but I just want Jesus to come. Okay. I have one question. Sure, go ahead, Esther. 
just a clarification. Mm -hmm. So although they were able to speak in that language, they 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 didn't understand fully what they was. Okay, let me put it another way. They were spoken as far as they're concerned, they were speaking in the language of their tongue. But the the people that that understand another language other than them was understanding it because it came out and came through from them as the language of the other speaking tongues. So they were able to hear, so they were able to understand what they were telling them. Okay, I'll phrase it like so, this. Um, okay, let, let me rephrase it. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. They were, from their knowledge and from their feeling, they were speaking in the normal, in the language of their tongue. But the people that were speaking the other language was understanding what they're speaking because what came out of their mouth was the other language of the other people that were listening to them. Um, no, I would, I would say that they knew they were speaking in this- In another language. Different language. Also, they knew they were speaking in a different language. Yeah, they knew. Okay. Um, and as they were speaking it, they were able to communicate with people who spoke that language. But I think where the gift of interpretation comes in is they might not have been able to translate back and forth between the two languages. So that's where the gift of interpretation came in, where you might be able to speak in uh, another language, but you can't necessarily translate what you said into the original language. And part of that could be due to like uh, people who speak Spanish, for example, sometimes like uh, when they're communicating something to you in English, they find it difficult because there are certain things you could say in, 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 in Spanish that you can't say as easily in English or there's no like direct translation. Um, there, there are like idioms and expressions that the Spanish language has, which don't really communicate well in English. So <clears throat> even though the people have the ability to speak in these other languages, they couldn't translate it unless they had the gift of interpretation also. Does that make sense? Oh, wait, I, th I think she missed my, exp my explanation. All right, so let me, let me say it again. Uh, so they received the ability to speak in other languages. And sometimes like there's certain things like idioms or expressions that you could say in one language, but don't clearly translate into another language. So because of that, apparently they weren't able to interpret um, themselves for people who, let's say, who spoke their original language or who spoke perhaps another language. So um, that's why the gift of interpretation was also needed. They could speak entirely in the other language, but for some reason they weren't able to cross communicate, meaning they weren't, they couldn't, they couldn't necessarily translate what they were saying in Spanish to English or to whatever language they spoke. So John, are you saying there's not a transliteration, but there's a translation of it? I'm saying that for, for some reason, God gave them the ability to speak in those languages and communicate what they needed to communicate, but they couldn't translate, I guess in all cases, unless they had the gift of interpretation into the original language that they spoke or the Galilean language, I guess in this case. So they knew what they were saying. They were communicating what they were saying, but they couldn't directly always translate. At least that's, that's what we see apparently. The gift of interpretation, however, allows them to be able to translate it. Like love is hard to translate into English and from Greek. Yeah. you know especially because of, of certain idioms and expressions that we have. Like, for example, if you tell somebody who speaks like Punjab or, 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 um, or Spanish, oh, that's just water under the bridge. They're going to look at you like you're crazy because they don't understand the expression. So certain idioms or expressions that you might use in English, you can't really translate to Spanish because it won't make sense to that person. 
All right. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next part. Unless someone is anybody still confused? All right. So Esther, did I answer your question? I think her mic is still muted. All right. Feel free to stop me anytime. I can always I can always go back in case somebody didn't understand something. All right. So let's move on to the next part. Paul makes clear that the purpose of tongues is for understanding. That's something that totally puts to rest this idea that many have of tongues being some type of heavenly language or something that people spoke. Tongues was, it's, it's very, very clear in Paul's writing that tongues was used for the purpose of understanding. That is not what's happening in all these different churches today. So let's break this down. First, we're gonna look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse six. But now brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues or languages, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Okay, I'm gonna read that one more time. But now brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? In other words, how shall I benefit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching. So in other words, if Paul comes speaking with languages, it only profits or benefits his listeners if he speaks to them by revelation, that's revealing something to them, by knowledge, giving them understanding or wisdom, by prophesying, revealing something that God, uh, revealing something uh, from God to them, or by teaching, instructing them, which obviously has no benefit if you can't understand what the person's saying. We actually had this exercise uh, from time to time in, in, uh, in my school where um, they give you this assignment to do that's entirely in a language that you don't know. The last time, I think it was Chinese, and nobody understood what to do with the assignment. And the purpose is that it was, it was to show people that when you teach students who speak another language and are just learning English for the first time, it's frustrating to them because not only don't they know how to write or respond in that language, you can't even follow the directions unless you can read them and understand them. So Paul is making it clear that, you know, if you're trying to teach somebody something and they don't understand what you're saying, you're not going to profit them at all. So the purpose of tongues is that it's supposed to help with re revelation, knowledge, prophesying and teaching. And if you're not revealing something, growing someone's knowledge, telling them what God has said or teaching them, then you're not profiting them by speaking with, with languages. So they are not profited if Paul speaks to them with tongues or languages, unless it's by revelation, knowledge, prophesying or teaching. So tongues is not a, is not a benefit unless the person doing it teaches, preaches, gives knowledge, or reveals something for their understanding. This again shows us that tongues was for the purpose of communicating, not speaking so that no one can understand what's being said. Is that what we see happening in, uh, in, in um, Pentecostal churches or circles today? No. If somebody's speaking in a gibberish, you can't possibly be teaching anybody anything because they don't understand what you're talking about. You can't be prophesying to anybody because they don't understand what you're, what you're telling them. You can't be growing someone's knowledge, wisdom, or understanding because they don't understand you. And you haven't revealed anything. So tongues here is also in the plural showing that Paul was talking about speaking in foreign languages, more than one tongue, more than one language. 
it was no it was of no benefit unless it communicated as specified in the last part of the verse so if i come to you speaking with different kinds of language or multiple languages what shall i profit you except i speak to you either by revealing something bringing knowledge preaching or prophesying or by teaching so the purpose of tongues or 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 speaking with languages was to bring and grow understanding god didn't want to confuse people he was using these languages to reach people because that was the only, some of them didn't speak the Hebrew language. They didn't speak the language of, 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 of Israel because they had been uh, annexed from their homeland and brought to these foreign lands where they grew up speaking these foreign tongues. And so the only way to reach them with the gospel is to reach them with their languages that they were speaking at this point in time. That's why this gift was given. There's a constant theme here from verses one all the way down to verse eight. And the theme is the theme of communication. Let's look at verses seven to eight. This, this theme is very clearly established. And to try to interpret 1 Corinthians 14 outside of the context of communication is to misinterpret it and completely wrench it from its context. So let's look at verses seven and eight. Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes a certain sound, sorry, makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? What does Paul mean there? What's he talking about? Especially this last part of the verse. If the, if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? Paul uses the analogy of musical instruments to point out that everything that makes a sound does so with distinction so that it can send the right signals or messages for everyone's benefit. If no one understands the music, it's of no benefit or enjoyment. If no one understands the call of the trumpet, the army doesn't know what to do. That's the point of Paul's analogy. Nobody's going to enjoy the music if they can't tell apart the sounds. Nobody's going to prepare for battle. You can sound a trumpet all you want, but if it doesn't make the sound that everybody's looking to hear, then they don't know when they're supposed to get ready for battle or not. So the key theme that's being developed here from verses 1 all the way down to verse 8 is this theme of communication. That's why the gift of tongues was given for communication. And when people start talking about, oh, well, nobody in the room needs to understand I'm speaking in a heavenly language, they're totally taking this passage out of context, not understanding what the purpose of the gift of tongues was for. Communication. So the purpose of tongues was to communicate and only in that context is the gift beneficial, purposeful, and profitable. Okay, so I'll say that one more time. The gift of tongues was given to communicate and only in the context of communication is this gift beneficial, purposeful, or profitable. Because as we saw in the previous slide, Paul makes it very clear. Let me go back. He says, if I come to you speaking with languages, what shall I profit you? In other words, how am I going to benefit you? Except, here's the exception to the rule, or unless I speak to you by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching. So if he doesn't reveal, bring knowledge, preach, or teach, he basically is saying here, I'm not benefiting you by, the, by being able to speak in another language. So the purpose has always been communication. So if what was going on in the Pentecostal circles and other religions was the gift of the Holy Spirit, that's completely contrary to what Paul said that the gift was for. It's for communication. 
Now, next Paul uses this phrase in verse nine, speaking into the air. So he says, so likewise, you, unless you by, utter by the tongue, words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. That's verse nine. Paul concludes his, his analogy by making, the, by making his point that words uttered by the tongue need to be easily understood. And so speaking in tongues or with tongues, as he says, is of no benefit unless people understand it. When one is not understood, they are speaking into the air. That's the phrase that Paul uses. It's much like our phrase when we say a person's just shooting the breeze. They're not talking about anything in particular. They're just shooting the breeze. They're just talking, right? So he uses this phrase, they're speaking into the air. In other words, sound is coming out of your mouth. It's going into the air, but nobody understands what you're talking about. So this phrase provides context for understanding what Paul means by speaking to God. He didn't mean when he said that they're not speaking to men, but unto God, that that was intentional. What he means is that they're not directly or intentionally, but in effect, they're speaking to God. Because if you are speaking into the air and nobody else understands you, only God can get that message. So he was actually being facetious or, or um, uh, using uh, uh, a form of rhetoric to make a much larger point. But what happens is that many people in Pentecostal cir uh, circles who believe in this thing called glossalia, they take these words out of context, not realizing what Paul was talking about here. He wasn't saying that people were intentionally talking to God. What he's talking about is how when people start speaking into the air and nobody understands what they're saying, well, they're talking to God because only God understands it. That was the context in which Paul made that statement. Let me just pull that up again so you guys can see verses one and two. I mean, verses um, uh, two and uh, nine. So again, uh, he that speaketh in a tongue or language speaks not unto men, but unto God, for no one or for no man understands him. However, in the spirit or in the breath, he speaks mysteries. So the reason why they're speaking to God is because, for, because no one understands him or no one understands. Now, skipping down to verse nine. So likewise, ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall be speak, for you shall speak into the air. In other words, you're talking, sound is coming out, it's going into the air, but nobody understands what you're talking about. Nobody can say anything. Nobody can contribute to the conversation. Nobody can say, yeah, he's right. Why? Because nobody understands what you're talking about. So you're speaking into the air. You're talking to God because only he can hear and understand you. That's the context in which Paul made the statement. But often people take it out of context and they say, oh, well, Paul says that the person was speaking to God. No, he didn't mean intentionally. It's very clear from the context because from verse one all the way down to verse nine, He's very clear and repeats this theme over and over again that when a person speaks with languages, they're supposed to be understood. And only when they are understood is that gift a blessing or is speaking in a language a blessing to the people of the church or the people present. So he's not encouraging people to just talk in a language where only God understands them. He's saying, it's of no benefit. Stop doing this. See, the purpose of 1 Corinthians 14 wasn't to encourage people to speak in a language that nobody else in the room understands. It was to discourage that, to tell them to stop doing that because it wasn't beneficial. All right, so that brings me to the point that the earlier phrase where, where, where Paul tells them uh, that they're speaking to God, he didn't mean literally, he was being facetious. And Paul typically uses uh, facetious rhetoric uh, throughout his writings, meaning like he'll say one thing, but he doesn't actually mean what he's saying. 
uh, he's using a form of rhetoric to make a point. So an example of this is in uh, Romans chapter six, verse one, where Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, if you were to take that one line out of context, you could use it to say, hey, look, Paul said that we're supposed to continue in sin so that we can have grace. But that's not what he was actually saying. He's putting across the ridiculous to make a, a much larger point about the truth. So Paul does that pretty frequently in his, in his writings. He'll ask a, ridic a, a ridiculous rhetorical question or he'll make a ridiculous statement in order to make a much larger point that supersedes the statement he previous made, he previously made. And that's kind of the same thing that we see going on in uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse two, when he says, you're not speaking to men, but unto God, um, he's being facetious and pointing out that you're not actually communicating with anybody. What you're doing is pointless. Romans chapter three, verse five is another example of Paul using this sort of rhetoric. Uh, but if our, righteous, uh, if our unrighteousness can mend the righteousness of God, what shall we say then? Is God unrighteous who takes vengeance? I speak as a man. So this facetious speaking is, is, what, I, is what I'm referring to when Paul says, like, I speak as a man. In other words, he's, he's speaking using human thinking. Uh, so what he's, meant, what he's saying isn't meant to be taken literally or as doctrine, but rather what he's saying is ridiculous to make a much larger point about something spiritual or something that is true. So he's not saying God is unrighteous because he takes vengeance, right? He's just speaking in words that humans speak in order to make the much larger point that his statement was ridiculous. And there's a much greater understanding to come. So Paul indicated that the statue of the unknown God was really a statue to the Lord. Now, obviously, this was not the intention of the builders. When the, when the, when the pagans built these statues, and when they built the statue to the unknown God, they did not have the Lord in mind. But Paul facetiously uses this to, to, to his advantage to introduce the people um, to the true God. So he used something that they knew in order to make a, a, a much larger point about the true God. Even though he knew that this statue to the unknown God was not really built to you know, the Lord God. So this example is found in Acts chapter 17, verse 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore you worship, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So again, the unknown, the statue to the unknown God was not really a statue to the Lord God, but he used that to his advantage in order to reach the pagans, taking something familiar to them to reach them uh, with something that they were not familiar with. So the key point that I want to make here is that Paul typically employs rhetoric to make larger points clear. He states the ridiculous, the impossible, or the unlikely in order to stress and emphasize important truth. So it's not really uh, a stretch at all or, or, or inconsistent with the way in which Paul writes when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2 and recognize that he's speaking facetiously or that he's speaking uh, with irony or sarcasm uh, when he says that he who speaks in an unknown language speaks not unto men, but to God. That's a consistent rhetorical device uh, that Paul uses in his writing. Now let's talk about the Greek word phone. It appears in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 10 to 12. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Now in this particular passage, the word languages is used or it's uh, the Greek word phone is translated languages. Now, this word doesn't actually mean languages, but rather means noises, 
sounds, voices that can be a language only by implication. So the Greek word um, uh, glossa can literally mean language, whereas this word would mean a noise, a sound, or a voice, which can loosely imply a language. So that's something to keep in mind when you look at verses 10 to, uh, to 12. Uh, if, you, if you look at other passages that use this particular uh, term, phone, Greek word phone, you'll see it in Matthew chapter 2, verse 18, Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. So for example, for example, in Rama, was there a voice heard? That's the Greek word phone, voice. Uh, Matthew 3, verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Again, the Greek word phone. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, and lo, a voice from heaven. So notice that it's not saying a language was from heaven or a language of one crying in the wilderness or a language was heard in Rama. Rather, it's a voice. Okay. So there are, th this is like one of those times when sometimes having an understanding of the Greek can help us correctly interpret a passage. Whereas when you don't have an understanding of the Greek, it makes it really difficult to ascertain the meaning, the true meaning of a passage, and we can make all kinds of guesses and end up wrong. So here the passage is basically saying there are, there, there are it may be, many kinds of voices in the world. And none of them is without significance. In other words, each type of voice has a significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the voice, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he shall be a foreigner, and he, does, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. In other words, if we don't understand each other's voices, we're both foreigners to each other. You see how, again, he's emphasizing the importance that languages are for communication. So he revisits that theme again in verses 10 to 12, clearly pointing out, hey, if I don't understand the meaning of these words, if I don't know the meaning of the voice, that person's a foreigner to me, I'm a foreigner to him because we don't understand each other. We're not getting anywhere. Now, in the same passage, Paul is saying that all voices have significance. People speak in order to communicate. They communicate in order to get across to the other individual a main point or a significance. That's what the word significance means, that he's trying to get across a meaning or a point. In fact, the Greek word translated here as significance literally means meaning. So Paul basically said here, no voices in the world are without meaning. Every time somebody sounds their voice, they're intending to get across a meaning. That's why if the meaning, the Greek word could also be translated the strength or the force. If the meaning or the strength or the force of the voice cannot be known or understood, the speaker and listener becomes foreigners or barbarians to each other. So the second Greek word uses a, a different term, which can be translated strength or force. So the second time we see the word um, um, significance, uh, it can mean strength, force, or meaning. Paul is referring to the main point to be communicated by the speaker, the force or strength of his word or his discourse. That's what he's getting at here. So again, over and over again in 1 Corinthians 14, the theme that keeps being repeated over and over and over again is this theme that languages are, or, or tongues are for the purpose of communicating meaning and understanding. When they don't do that, they are not of benefit to anybody in the church. You're speaking into the air. You must be speaking to God because nobody else understands what you're saying. That's the context in which Paul wrote these words. <clears throat> now in verse 12, he talks about building. Let's, let's talk about eager to build. Let's, let's look at this, at this passage. Even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. OK? 
Okay. Now the word zealous can also be translated eager. Um, and to and the word edification can also be translated building up, like as if you're building something, like a like a Lego set, for example. If you're building a Lego set and you put one block on top of another, you're building up that Lego set, maybe into a house or a building or some form of structure. That's the the what the what the idea is that he's trying to communicate. He's using a building analogy. So anyway, even so, since you are zealous or eager for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification or the building up of the church that you seek to excel. In other words, if you're looking, if you're eager to have spiritual gifts, don't just have spiritual gifts for the sake of having spiritual gifts. But if you want a spiritual gift, the purpose of getting that spiritual gift should be to build up the church, to benefit the church in some way. That's what he said in verse 12. It's great to be eager for spiritual gifts, but if you're going to want a spiritual gift, how is it being used to build up the church? Paul makes clear that all the gifts of the Spirit are for the building up of the church and that it's good to desire or be eager for spiritual gifts, but they should be desired to excel in building up the church. In other words, don't just desire spiritual gifts because they're cool. They're cool to have. And certainly they demonstrate God's miracle working ability but they were to desire gifts in order to further the mission and be of benefit to the church. Speaking in tongues or speaking in languages, according to Paul, is of no benefit to the church if the words do not reveal, proclaim, or preach, if they don't teach or provide knowledge for those listening. Paul said it very clearly himself in verse 6. And yet, in our modern day uh, Pentecostal circles, that preaching, teaching, proclaiming, and revealing or providing knowledge or teaching is definitely not what's happening. If somebody's speaking in gibberish, nobody's learning anything. Nothing is being revealed because nobody understands what's being said. That's the complete opposite of what Paul said was supposed to happen. So it's interesting that people are replacing in, in our day and age a gift of the spirit with a complete counterfeit that does the exact opposite of what Paul said it was supposed to do. So there is no speaking in a heavenly language. They're speaking in known human languages. And Paul says that this gift isn't to be used uh, in the church when nobody understands or knows those languages. Verse 13 talks about the gift of interpretation. Therefore, or that's why, let him who speaks in a tongue or in a language pray that he may interpret. Okay, well, why is he saying that? So remember the word therefore means that's why. So let's go back to verse 12 and then we'll read into verse 13 so that we have the context. Even so, you, since you are eager or zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification or the building up of the church that you seek to excel. That's why. Let, let him who speaks in a language or tongue pray that he may interpret. So this did not necessarily mean that the person had the, spiritual, uh, uh, had the spiritual gift, but rather that the person could speak in a language not known to those present. Everybody assumes when they read 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 14 that Paul is talking about receiving some kind of supernatural ability, but he's actually not. Uh, so he's speaking to an audience of people that spoke in different languages. And so he's, he's, he's speaking not just about the, the, the gift of tongues, meaning the ability to speak in languages that one had not known, but he's also speaking about the natural ability that some individuals had in speaking in a different language. So he, in this passage, he's actually addressing both people with the supernatural gift and people without the supernatural gift. And his point is to say, hey, there's no point in speaking in a, in, a, in a language that nobody else knows because it's not a benefit to anybody unless you are communicating the understanding of that language. So in verse 13 here, he says, hey, if you're going to speak in another language, pray that somebody can interpret. Notice here, the passage says, who speaks in a tongue. In other words, speaks in a language. We've gone back to the singular form again. 
So he's not talking about speaking with tongues, meaning multiple languages, but now he's talking about speaking in a tongue, meaning a language of many languages. So you're speaking in a specific language that's one language among other kinds of language. So the person now is speaking in a tongue. And, and the fact that he uses, first of all, the indefinite article shows us that there is more than one type of tongue, meaning more than one type of language. And the fact that he uses the term tongue or language here indicates that he's talking about language in general, Spanish, English, French, Greek, Assyrian, whatever the language might be. So the passage does not say speak with tongues as in, as in several at once or in the tongue or with a heavenly tongue. That's not what the passage says. It says that any person who speaks with a tongue, meaning a language, should pray to interpret so that others can understand. So whether you receive the ability to speak with another language uh, through um, a miracle, or whether you naturally have the ability to speak in another language, Paul here is saying, pray that somebody else can interpret what you're saying so that they can understand what you're communicating. Don't just start talking and nobody understands what you're saying. So this was a general rule that could include both the gift to speak in another language, as well as individuals in that port city of Corinth who naturally spoke in a language that others didn't know or understand. So the key point here, if you are speaking in a language that others don't know or understand, pray for the gift to interpret what you were saying so that others can be blessed by it. Okay, so Paul makes that point crystal clear. I'm going to read that part one more time because I think I see that Esther logged out and then logged back in. Um, so I'll repeat it one more time. The key point here in, uh, in, in verse 13, if you are speaking in a language that others don't know or don't understand, pray for the gift to interpret what you're saying so that others can be blessed by it. The whole point is communication. If nobody knows what you're talking about, you're talking, but you're not communicating. The faith we have, the faith that trusts God's will to be. I'm going to pause here for a second. Are there any questions so far? Is there anything that maybe is confusing or needs clarification? Kaya, I think I understand. Although I'm in and out sometimes. Rocks as weapons. Yes. Rocks, those things. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone need clarification? Can you imagine being stoned to death? When I think All right, I'm going to go ahead and move forward. Now, in order to understand verses 14 to 17, I have to go back and, and repeat something that I've said a bunch of times in many of our Bible studies that we've talked about. And this is going to be about the word spirit. Remember that sometimes when people see the word spirit in a passage, they jump to all kinds of conclusions, to all kinds of interpretations, not realizing the fact that the word that's the Greek word that's used there for spirit has multiple meanings. And you have to be careful of the context before you just run wild when you see the word spirit. So I'm going to read this passage first using the word spirit. And then we're going to break down what really was meant by the word that's used there. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For, it, for you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Now, because in the King James Version, the word spirit is used, people run wild. They say, oh, oh, he's talking about praying in the spirit. They mean, and they think that it means praying in the Holy Spirit. Oh, he's singing in the spirit. So he must be singing in the Holy Spirit or in some kind of trance-like state. Oh, he's blessing with the Spirit. So he must be blessing in the Holy Spirit. That's what they think when they read the passage. Not realizing 
that the word spirit there is the Greek word pneuma. So this passage is commonly misunderstood because of the use of the Greek word pneuma. And the King James translators translated the, the, the Greek word pneuma here as spirit. That's why people are running wild with the passage. So it is, it is assumed that if the spirit does each of these things, pray, sing, bless, then the tongue is under the control of the Holy Spirit who does all these things on behalf of the individual using some form of heavenly utterance. This is not what the passage says. Paul fluctuates between the phrase, my spirit and the spirit, which shows that he is not necessarily talking about the Holy Spirit. Let's look at it again. Look, look carefully. For if I pray in a tongue or in a language, my spirit prays. So there he said, my spirit. I will pray with the spirit. I will sing with the spirit. Well, hey, wait a minute. First he says, my spirit. Then he says, the spirit. Now, who does the spirit belong to? Uh, God. So the my spirit cannot possibly be the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit doesn't belong to Paul. Paul belongs to God. So what does he mean when he says my spirit prays? Me personally. <laughs> Remember, the, the Greek word penuma. Huh? When, when God says my spirit, meaning the, the personality, the type, the type of person God. that Christ says. My spirit. Is it, if God Paul spirit. is saying this. Mm -hmm. Paul, Paul is saying, saying it this, time, this not right? God. Not God. Mm -hmm. My spirit prays of myself, my spirit of myself, my own personal self, not from any help from God. Now, you know why you guys are having trouble with this? <laughs> because you keep forgetting about what the Greek word pneuma means. Pneuma breath. can mean spirit, but it can also mean breath. It can also mean wind. Oh, okay. It can mean spirit as in an angel. So, my breath. so you have to use the context in order to be able to figure out what he's talking about. Okay. So in this case, we know he's been talking about communication throughout the entire passage, all the way down to verse 14 and now, and now down to verse 17. Communication has been the theme from the, from the very first verse of chapter 14. So the word spirit here, or the word penuma that's used here shouldn't be translated spirit, but rather breath. Now I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna read it again, but this time I'm gonna replace the word spirit with breath and let's see if it makes sense. For if I pray in a language, my breath plays, sorry, my breath, my breath prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the breath and I, all, I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the breath and I will also sing with understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the breath, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not understand what you say? For in, you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Does that make more sense to you? Yeah. So in other words, what he's saying here is that if he starts talking and nobody understands what he's talking, if he's not communicating understanding, then nobody's benefiting from it. So he's saying, yeah, I can pray in a language and yeah, my breath is, is uttering out a prayer, but my understanding is unfruitful. In other words, nobody understands what I'm saying. Nobody's benefiting from what I'm, from what I'm speaking. What's the conclusion then? I will pray with the breath and I will also pray with understanding. In other words, I'm not just gonna utter words out into the air. I wanna pray communicating the understanding so that somebody else can be blessed by my prayer. I will sing with the breath and I will sing also with the understanding. If I'm singing a song in another language and nobody understands um, what the words of that song are saying, how do they know whether they should enjoy the song or not. Mm -hmm. They don't. 
So Paul says, hey, I'm going to sing with my breath. I'm going to send words out into the air, but I'm also going to communicate understanding through those words so that others can be blessed by my song. So are we saying breath plus understanding equals communication? Exactly. That's exactly what he's saying. That's a great way to put it. Breath plus understanding equals communication. Otherwise, if you bless with the breath, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen? Now, we talked about the place of the uninformed. Means it's, if somebody else doesn't speak that language and you're, bl you're, you're blessing with the breath, words are coming out of your mouth, but he doesn't understand you, he can't say amen. You could have been saying great stuff, but if he doesn't understand you, you could have given thanks well, but the other person isn't being blessed by your words because they don't understand them. So now when we replace the word spirit with the word breath, we can see that Paul is clearly on the same theme that he was on since verse one. But unfortunately, because the King James Version uses the word spirit, people take this passage and they spiritize it and go all over the map with it saying, oh, oh, Paul's in the spirit. And then they make up all kinds of uh, crazy theology uh, that's not intended by the author. So this is another one of those instances where understanding the Greek greatly impacts and influences correct understanding of the passage. So there's nothing here that suggests a heavenly language at all. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, communicating, singing, uh, praying, blessing in a language that people can understand. Uh, just to kind of solidify this point so that you can see I'm not making it up. In the Hebrew, the word ruach uh, meant spirit, breath, uh, could mean an angel, could mean uh, wind. And when the Bible was translated from uh, Hebrew into Greek, that's what's called the Septuagint, the, the Greek word penuma was a transliteration of the Hebrew word ruach. So penuma in Greek and Hebrew ruach are the same word. They carry the same exact meaning. They both have the same multiple meanings. So let's take a look at Zechariah 6, verse 8. Then cried he unto me and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. Now, is he talking about quieting the Holy Spirit? Mm -mm. No. He basically is talking about quieting his, either his breath, his, his speech, or quieting his, uh, his mental disposition. Job chapter six, verse four. For the arrows of the almighty are within me. The poison whereof drinketh up my spirit. The terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. Was he talking about drinking up the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. No. He means that, he, that, that it was drinking up his mental disposition. So you can see here how the word spirit can have multiple meanings. Uh, and not necessarily, and, and notice one of the things I wanted to point out to you guys with these two passages is notice what words are used here. My spirit. And this isn't God talking, but this is the prophet talking. And he says, my spirit. And in Job 6, 4, my spirit. So when the phrase used is my spirit, is it talking about the Holy Spirit? If a human being is making the, is using the phrase? No. So when Paul says, my spirit, he cannot possibly be talking about the Holy Spirit. People who interpret it that way are misconstruing the passage. You can see um, similar language in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. And when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he, he, said, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And, he, and having said this, or having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now, what was it that Jesus gave up? Did he give up the Holy Spirit when he died? Anybody? Did Jesus no, give up? No, 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 his breath. His breath, yeah. So he, in other words, he breathed his last breath. So when he said, Father, into, my, into your hands, I commend my spirit. He didn't mean spirit. The word that's used there is panuma. He gave up his breath. And having said this, he gave up his breath. Uh, the word ghost and spirit are actually the same Greek word, panuma. 
Romans 1, 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I made mention of you always in my prayers. So was Paul serving with um, his Holy Spirit, or did he mean he was serving with his breath in the gospel of Jesus Christ? He was talking about preaching. So he's saying, yeah, I serve God with my breath. Because, why? Because I'm preaching the gospel. Other passages you could consider, Job 27, verse 3. All the while my breath is in me, the spirit of God is in my nostrils. Does God's spirit re uh, reside in a person's uh, nostrils? No, no, no. No. He's talking about That's the breath the of God. Mm -hmm. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And then shall th that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Is God going to consume those who are wicked with the spirit of his mouth? Does the spirit of God reside in Jesus' mouth? No, this is referring to the breath of his mouth, the breath of his lips. That's, I'm show, I show you guys this slide to point out how people constantly misconstrue the word spirit because the translators frequently uh, translated the Greek word panuma or Hebrew word ruach as spirit, not considering other possible translations. So you have to be aware that every time you see the word spirit, it doesn't always mean what you think it does. And that has to be factored in, certainly, when you're translating and looking at 1 Corinthians 14. So that means, that last one means that the Lord is going to take away his breath and he shall die from his brightness. <clears throat> no, he's going to slay the wicked with the breath of his mouth, meaning the Lord, as he speaks, his, his, his yeah. word, his, his breath will destroy the wicked. The Lord shall consume with yep. the spirit of whose breath? Of his mouth, the, uh, with the spirit of the Lord's mouth or the breath of the Lord's mouth. Okay, I didn't understand that. And if you got confused, you could also look at the passage which describes the second coming, which says the Lord <laughs> himself shall descend from heaven with what? The shout. With a shout. With the voice of voice the, of the, arch, the archangel. archangel. And with the trumpet of God. So at that time, notice that you're going to hear his voice. I need a further explanation. Sure, sure. All this, right, so at, at this last second one, coming, Second Thessalonians, yeah. Yeah. To eat. Um, let me pull up the passage. Hold on. Um, let me do a control S. You hear breath of his lips. Ah, here we go. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4. This makes it pretty clear. But with righteousness <laughs> shall he judge the poor and reprove right. the equity with equity the meek of the earth and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth what does that mean and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked but that is what i was asking you just now is it is he going to slay the breath of the wicked well i didn't use the word slay is he going to i said um cause to die or something like that you, i think you used uh this phrase down here uh the Lord shall right. consume with the spirit of his mouth. Right. This passage that, is actually in Second Thessalonians, in Second Thessalonians chapter two is actually quoting from the passage in Isaiah chapter um, chapter eleven. Uh huh. But so they're saying this the exact same thing. Okay. So God mm -hmm. or Jesus is going to slay the wicked mm -hmm. with the breath of his God's mouth or 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 his lips. His word is going to destroy the wicked. So how did you how did you interpret what I said? Maybe I um I I don't even understand what I said. What did you how did it, you? Interpret it seemed like you were I... saying that um God is going to destroy the wicked with the breath of their mouths. No, with the, oh oh okay okay yes I think so I think that's what I meant yeah yeah so the passage actually says <laughs> yes, that God is going to destroy the wicked yes. with the breath of His God's mouth. So God's yes. mouth and his and the breath that comes out of God's mouth will destroy the wicked. Right. And Isaiah verses 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 4 makes it very clear what's going to happen. Right. And, and also makes very clear that breath is what destroys the wicked 
And so when we read uh, Second Thessalonians chapter two, uh, mm -hmm. and it says here, the Lord shall consume with the panuma of his mm -hmm. mouth. Panuma mm -hmm. there should not be spirit, but rather breath, because that's what that's mm -hmm. what happened. Right, right. So basically, what I want you guys to get from this slide, if you don't yeah. understand everything else, the, the point of this slide is to show you that the word that's sometimes used and translated spirit can often mean breath and not spirit. And so when we look back at um, the previous passage, it would be a mistake to translate the uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14 to 17 with the word spirit. Because if I use the word spirit here, I could say, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. See, the spirit is praying in me. I could say, uh, I, I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with understanding. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let the, the spirit pray inside of me and then I'm gonna pray with understanding. I will sing because the spirit is singing inside of me. You see where you can go with that? That's mm -hmm. a mistake. But when you change the word spirit to breath, this mm. makes a whole lot more sense. My breath prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. I will pray with the breath, but also with the understanding. So in other words, breath is coming out of my mouth and also understanding is being communicated. My mind. Sing with the breath. I'm, I will also sing with understanding. So I'm singing with breath, right? Breath is coming out of my mouth as I'm singing, but mm -hmm. I'm also singing with understanding so that somebody else might benefit. I will bless with the breath. I'm blessing with breath coming out of my mouth, but I'm also blessing with, under, with understanding so that somebody who is, who is supposed to be blessed by what I say will understand. Mm -hmm. how, otherwise, how's he going to say amen? Because he doesn't understand. Me. <laughs> I might have so said some great stuff. It, it says here, for indeed you give thanks well, but the, uh, but the other is not edified because he doesn't get it. So this passage makes very clear that Paul is talking about the, 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 the tongue or the language being used to communicate mm -hmm. understanding. He's mm -hmm. not talking about something like strange or, 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 uh, or different that the, that the spirit of God is doing inside of you. He's talking about the breath being able to communicate with understanding rather than just going out into the air where nobody benefits from it. Which is not the same as my spirit will not always strive with you, right? As is Exodus. Right. Well, then we're talking about God. So when God was talking about right. my spirit, he's right. talking about the Holy Spirit, right. not his breath. Right. But isn't God doesn't always, I can't remember, use his spirit with a capital S. It's not that always like that. Well, in the Greek, actually, every word, every letter is capitalized. So there is no way to tell what's capitalized and what's not. Okay. So the context determines how to how to how to correctly translate it. Okay. All right. All right. So the word spirit. Anytime the word spirit appears in scripture, there's a tendency that people have, especially in charismatic circles, to what I call spiritize the passage and to add to the understanding of the passage that which the author did not intend to communicate. You have got to be careful about this. Make sure that whenever you're reading a passage, you check the context. Consider alternative meanings for the word ruach or, or, or the Greek word penuma, because penuma is a transliteration of the Hebrew ruach. So sometimes when you see the word spirit, it does not always mean what you think it does. And, pass, and people take that passage and they just jump all over the place with it. And they can come up with all kinds of things that really confuse people because they just see the word spirit there and they think nothing of it. All right. So again, on this screen, I replaced the word spirit with breath. Uh, can I get a volunteer to read it? For if I pray in a tongue, my breath prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the breath, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the breath. And I would also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the breath, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, 
but the other is not edified. Ah, does it make sense? Mm -hmm. And, and it continues the same theme, the same topic that Paul has been talking about since verse one. Mm -hmm. When no one understands the language, their breath praise, in other words, sound or wind comes out of their mouth, but they are not communicating the understanding and the action is unfruitful. It doesn't get us anywhere. <laughs> Paul re resolves this issue by concluding that he will, first of all, pray with the breath yeah. and the understanding. In other words, so that he can be understood. Sing mm -hmm. with the breath and understanding. Yeah. Again, so mm -hmm. that he can be understood. Bless with the breath and the understanding. Why? So he can be understood yeah. and the other person can yeah. say, amen. amen. <laughs> you can't be saying amen to stuff and you don't know what the person's saying. Yeah. So he won't just go through the motions mm -hmm. of, of, of these actions, but do them so that he can be understood by those present. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if you pray with the breath only, no one can say no one amen, can say. which means mm -hmm. so be it. That's so what amen it, means. Right. So be it. Yeah. So let it be. Yeah. So let it because be. they don't understand you, no matter how well you did at giving thanks to God. No mm -hmm. one can be edified if they don't get what you're saying. Now, he also uses this phrase, my understanding, which means communicating to share his understanding with those present by speaking in a language that they could understand and be blessed by. So you could talk, but if you're, if you're not communicating understanding as you talk, you're not getting anywhere. That's what he meant in, that, in, that, in verses 14 mm -hmm. to 17. All right, so the key theme here uh, we got up to verse 17. The key theme here mm -hmm. uh, is understanding. Notice mm -hmm. that the discourse of Paul is focused on the theme of communicating or using language to be understood. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians was not Paul introducing a new concept of a heavenly language, but rather making it clear to believers that they should avoid speaking in a, in a language, in any language that could not be easily understood by their listeners. That was the purpose and central idea of first corinthians 14. somehow over the years many people in pentecostal circles as well as others have completely taken this passage out of context and interpreted it in a whole new way that's not consistent with what paul actually meant mm -hmm. now here's another interesting point from verses 18 to 19. so i, I titled this slide five or ten thousand mm -hmm. and again as i go through this you'll see the whole passage is talking about being able to understand somebody. And what goes on in these Pentecostal circles is the complete opposite of being able to understand somebody. And people aren't realizing that they've gotten a counterfeit that's the exact opposite mm. of what God intended and what he wanted to give to the church and the purpose for which he wanted to give it to them. So let's look at 1 Corinthians uh, 14, verse 18 to 19. Check this out. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in, in the church, I, will, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Mm. Let's look at this carefully. First of all, Paul said that he speaks with what? Tongues. Tongues, languages, right? Multiple, Paul could speak multiple languages. He was the most educated of all the apostles. Yep. But he said, I would rather uh, speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also. Why did he want to speak five words with understanding? So that he could communicate and teach someone else. Then 10,000 words in a tongue. He goes back to the singular there. The reason why is because he's saying, I'd rather speak 10,000 words in a single language I'm sorry, I'd rather, speak 10, 000, I'd rather speak five words being understood than 10,000 words in any single language and not be understood. So Paul was not saying that he uses the gift of tongues or that he uses a heavenly language more than anyone else in the church. That's not what he was saying at all, but rather that he speaks in more languages than everyone else and or more often than everyone else. Tongues here is plural, indicating that, that Paul speaks with more than one language, not in a single language. And again, like I said before, Paul is the most educated of all the apostles. 
He emphasizes, despite, his, despite this ability, that it's better to communicate five words and be understood so that, uh, so that others can be taught rather than 10,000 words in a singular tongue or language. The switch mm -hmm. here from plural to singular indicates that he is talking about earthly languages, not a heavenly one. Because first he says, I speak with tongues, plural, more than everybody else, but I would rather speak five words with my understanding than 10,000 words in a tongue or language. So as he switches there from plural to singular, it shows that he speaks multiple languages, but he would rather mm -hmm. communicate in language that people understand than 10,000 words in some other language that nobody understands. So he is referring to speaking 10,000 words in one of many languages that he could speak, which could not be understood by his listeners. Instead, he, he, he would choose the tongue or language that, uh, um, uh, that they could understand and be content with communicating five words rather than 10,000. So in other words, it's better to speak five words that people understand than 10,000 words that nobody understands. So again, Paul's emphasis is, is clearly on communicating to be understood. So why are the Pentecostal churches speaking in gibberish that nobody in that room understands? Hmm. Does that at all Sound like, sound like what Paul was describing here in verses 1 to 19. At all. No. It's the complete counterfeit or opposite of the spiritual gift. And they don't realize it. <laughs> now, here, here it gets even more interesting. Verse 20. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. Now, this is very key. This is very central to his, to, his, to his ideas. He says here, he wants them to understand each other and to mature in their understanding, which they can't do if they don't communicate to be understood. If I stand up in the church, I'm like, blah, 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 and nobody knows what I'm talking about. How can their understanding be mature? It can't, because nobody understands what I'm saying. So he, so he says, he draws a comparison. He says, okay, when it comes to being, to having malice, if you want to be a baby in that, be a baby in that, because that's stuff that we're not supposed to understand. In other words, be oblivious and without understanding the things that are bad, like malice. Mm -hmm. But in things that are meant to be understood, he said they were to mature and they were to grow. If somebody's speaking in a language that nobody understands, there's no understanding taking place. There's no growing taking place. There's no teaching taking place. There's no learning taking place. There can't be. So this analogy was meant to get at uh, that, that they should seek to grow in knowledge, which can't be done if everyone speaks in a different language. They could not teach each other uh, uh, under, under such circumstances. So this passage is connected to Paul's larger argument and, 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 not, and not a tangent. It solidifies his earlier point. So as you can see from verses one all the way down to verse 20, over and over and over again, Paul keeps repeating the same thing over and over again. Communicate, speak with languages to be understood. How did somebody walk away from this passage with the idea that Paul was promoting the idea of speaking in some heavenly language that nobody can understand. You can't really get that from this passage when you read verses one to 20. It's all because of not understanding the Greek and not taking time to consider the meaning of certain words in the context of the whole passage. Okay, the word through foreigners. That brings us to verse 21. We kind of already talked about this, but I'm going to just go through it again quickly. Uh, in verse 21, Paul quotes from Isaiah chapter 28. And he says, in the law, it is written. So he uses scripture to solidify his point. In the law, it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people 
And yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. So Paul quotes from Isaiah 28, which dealt with God speaking to his people in a foreign language. The immediate context of Isaiah 28 was the language of the Assyrians. That's what he was talking about when he said, I will speak to this people with, uh, with uh, other tongues and with other lips. He was talking about the Assyrians. Paul, and, and in the Greek, as we talked about before, that, that phrase, other lips, can be translated foreign language. So Paul relates this to how God, could, to how God would speak to unbelievers through other languages here in 1 Corinthians 14. So the quote points out that God would speak to unbelievers through foreign languages, and even so, the unbelievers would not change or listen. So God never intended for this passage to be interpreted as stammering, strange, heavenly speech. No, he was talking about foreign language, as was very clear in Isaiah 28. But people take this out of context. They don't even sometimes go back to read Isaiah 28 or consider that the passage was directly talking about the foreign language of the Assyrians. So now we're at gibberish versus languages. At the time of the Hebrews, sorry, at, at the time the Hebrews did not understand the speech of the Assyrians. After the captivity, they would understand it later on. The Jews of Paul's time spoke the languages of many Gentile nations. We see that in Acts chapter two, verse two to sorry, in Acts chapter two, all the way through Acts chapter four. And this was because of the captivity. They were annexed or kicked out of their, of their homeland and brought to, to many of these foreign nations. And so God would speak to them in these languages of these foreign nations, which were not understood by the Hebrews of Isaiah 28. And thus, this would fulfill the prophecy. So the prophecy was never about speaking to people in languages impossible and unintelligible for any human being to understand, so as to bring about confusion. Else, the passage would, would, would not have said, yet for all that, they will not hear me or they will not listen to me. If God wanted to be listened to, why would he speak to them in gibberish? Think about it. If God was going to hold them accountable for what was preached to them, would he speak to them in gibberish? No. <laughs> It'd be kind of messed up to be like, blah, 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 blah. now, if you don't listen <laughs> to me and you don't do what I said, you're in trouble. That'd be kind of messed up. Yep. Right? But that's not what God did. He, he, he would speak to them in the languages of the foreigners because that's the places where they were driven to in the captivity. And that, those are the languages that the people would speak because they were annexed from their homeland and their descendants grew up only speaking those foreign languages. So like, for example, I have many friends in, in, my, in, my, uh, in my neighborhood who are Jewish. Guess what language they speak? Hebrew? Nope. Hebrew. What is a Jew language? No, they, they, they live in my community right here in Massapequa. Guess what language they speak? English. English. You know why? Because they're here in the United I States. Understand. Mm -hmm. They grew up in this town speaking English. Mm -hmm. Right? Because mm -hmm. they're American. Mm -hmm. If I were to speak to them in Hebrew, you think they'd understand me? Mm -mm. No. No. Nope. I mean, maybe they might pick up a few words here or there because they do go to Hebrew school. Among but generally yourself, speaking, okay. uh, they would probably not understand me, especially if I was fluent. Mm. The reason why is because they grew up here in the U.S. There are many people who speak Spanish, for example, or sorry, there are many people from Spanish speaking countries, for example, that grow up here in the United States and they do not speak Spanish. In fact, I had a couple of students tell me that they failed Spanish. <laughs> so they come from foreign they come from foreign countries where Spanish is the dominant language, but when they grow up here in the United States, they cannot speak in, they cannot speak Spanish, they cannot write in Spanish, and in some cases may not even understand Spanish. Mm. Why does that happen? They speak in a language which you could be understood. Yeah, they, it's because they grow up speaking English and never learned their native tongue. When the Jews were annexed from their homeland and brought into captivity in these foreign nations, 
they lost the ability to speak in their native tongue. Mm. And so in order to communicate the gospel to them, God had to give his disciples the ability to speak in these new languages because otherwise, using Hebrew or Aramaic, they could not communicate uh, with these foreigners. Repeat that again. When the Jews what? When the Jews were annexed from their homeland and brought into Uh captivity in these foreign nations, they lost Uh the ability to speak in their native Hebrew tongue. Yeah. And so as a result of that, when the gospel had to go out, if 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 the disciples all went out speaking Hebrew, most of these foreign Jews would not have understood it. That was before, that was, um, and then when the, uh, I don't want to was free, that was when God sent them into all cities and so on because they disobeyed him, right? Exactly. So that when they were, God were calling them back, they had a hard time understanding one another, something like that. Okay, no. When, when they were disobedient, right? And they were punished mm-hmm. for, their, for their sins. Mm-hmm. God drove them out of their homeland and they went right. into all these foreign, lang- all these right. foreign lands. Uh, particularly Babylon and, and, the, and the northern tribes into Assyria. Right. The problem is that after the, after, from generation to generation, mm-hmm. the new generations did not speak the original language. Mm-hmm. They could speak Persian. Mm-hmm. They could speak Greek, but they could not speak Hebrew. Mm-hmm. Right? And I'm generalizing. I'm, uh, you know, there, I'm sure I there understand. were some people, like maybe the, the, the rabbis or whatever, that could speak Hebrew. But generally speaking, the average person probably could not speak Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So the point is that in order for the gospel to go out to those people who were, who were, who were in captivity in all these different countries, how could you communicate with them if all you spoke was Hebrew? You can't. Mm. So that is why God had to send prophets or something like that in those countries or something. That's why God had to give the, the, the disciples the gift of tongues. Right. Because without that gift, those Mm. Jews who lived in those foreign nations Mm -hmm. could not hear or understand the gospel. Amen, I got it. That was was how the prophecy of Isaiah 28 was fulfilled. Mm. Mm. So God would speak to them, to to the Jews, in these languages, which were not understood by the Hebrews of Isaiah 28. And so he fulfilled mm-hmm. the prophecy. See, a lot of people, when they read mm-hmm. about the gift of tongues and, and they see that the disciples went out speaking in these multiple languages, mm-hmm. they assume that the reason why they were given these languages to speak was so that they could talk to the Gentiles. But the gospel right. at first didn't go to the Gentiles. It went to Not the Jews. Yeah. So why do you need multiple languages to speak to Jewish yeah. people? Because of the captivity. Right. They spoke right. all these different foreign languages And when they came to Jerusalem in Acts chapter two, there were people from many different parts of the world. They were Jewish, but they spoke different languages. Right. It wasn't so Yeah, go ahead. I don't want to stray too far, but why did he send the disciples there? Because he was planning to prepare them to bring them back to Jerusalem as a people together. Well, they were being brought back to Jerusalem because it was time for the pilgrimage. It was was time for uh, for the Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost. So mm. they were required to come back to Jerusalem, uh, mm. that, uh, you know, three times a year. And in, in this particular time, it was Pentecost, uh, where mm. they would come to worship. So what would happen mm. is every year, uh, Jewish people who lived in different parts of the world would mm. come to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts. But the problem mm. was they did not speak the language of, of Hebrew uh, when, they, when they made right. this pilgrimage back. Okay. So the disciples were given the ability to speak with these different languages so that they could communicate the gospel with these foreign Jews who no longer lived in Israel. Good, good. Crystal clear, crystal clear. And also perhaps to to, to spread the gospel when they go back. Yes. I'm going to pull up a a map just so you get a a visual of this. Maybe uh, it might Mm. might help to, to visualize it a little bit better. So let me do mm-hmm. uh, Google. I just wanted to link what, what you're saying now without, without diverting too much. Yeah, no problem. All right. So let's, um, let's mm-hmm. take a look at a map that would make this a lot easier for us to understand. 
So I'm gonna actually going to go to Israel. Where are they? Yes, here. Here we go. So let me kind of zoom in here. I might have just zoomed in too much, but I hope not. We'll see. And yeah, here we go. I zoomed in a little bit too much. I'm going to zoom out a little bit just so we can get a bigger picture. Okay, so Israel is right here, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when they disobeyed, so first you have the northern tribes, then you have the southern tribes. So the southern tribes mm -hmm. were Judah, Judah, which is from about this part of the map down. The northern tribes were Israel, which were from about right. this part of the map up. Up. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, mm -hmm. when the northern tribes were disobedient, they were conquered by the Assyrians who lived to the north. So let me just zoom out a little bit more. It's kind of hard to hear. All right, so they were, they were conquered by, not Syria, but Assyria. The Assyrian, Assyrian Empire was really towards the north, even above Syria. So somewhere up in this region up here. Mm -hmm. when, when, the, when the northern tribes fell in battle, they were annexed, kicked out of the northern tribes of Israel, and they were brought to these foreign lands up here in the area mm. that we now call Turkey. Mm. Or uh, actually, I'm not really sure where Assyria would have been. I guess I can look that up. Give me a second. Um, Assyria is like where Nineveh would have been. So I'll just put Assyrian Empire. And I should have put map in there. Ah, it gave it to me. I got what I need. So uh, this was the, the Assyrian Empire at its height. And as you can see, when they conquered Israel, they, they controlled this territory. And when they annexed the Jews, or the Israelites, I mean, they brought them to all these different territories that they now own. Now, the Jews in the southern tribes, they, they were pretty much down here, this part of the map. When they were kicked out, uh, well, the Babylonians were the ones who kicked them out after their disobedience. God called uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar kicked the, the southern tribes out of uh, the land of Judah. And they were brought to Babylon, which is modern day Iraq. So this is where they were brought. Now, the people who remained there, uh, you know, when you think about the Samaritans, those were people who still occupied the land, but they were not uh, supposedly the original, the original Israelites who lived there. That's why the Jews and the Samaritans never got along. So in reality, the, Jew, the tribes of Judah, the, the southern tribes were brought here and the northern tribes were brought way up here, like roughly around where Turkey is. Now that poses a problem because if you're gonna live in Iraq or Babylon as it was then, or you're gonna live in Assyria, you have to learn their languages. And then shortly after the fall of Babylon, the Medes and the Persians took over. So now that's another language that they had to learn. After that, the Greeks took over. That's now another language that they had to learn. So over time, they, many of the common people lost the ability to speak in the Hebrew language that they would have learned had they grown up here. And they began to speak in these foreigner languages because they were annexed from their land. Does that make sense? Camilla, you still with me? Uh, mute. Yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> okay. Very much so, yes, sorry. All right, so now this gives us a framework for understanding why the gift of tongues was needed because you had Jews living in all these parts of the world, especially in this area here. And even though they lived in these different parts of the world, once a year, once the captivity was over, they were free to return to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Passover or the Day of Atonement, three times a year. But one of the weaknesses, even though they can make the pilgrimage, many of them may not have spoken the Hebrew language. So they needed maybe translators. They needed uh, you know, maybe some help with certain things. They could not speak in, in many cases the Hebrew language because they were from these regions of the world. Now, the problem is, okay, they are all brought to Jerusalem, but how do you talk to them if they don't speak Hebrew? 
or they don't even speak Aramaic. How do you talk to these people? You can't. That's why God gave the disciples the gift of tongues to communicate mm -hmm. with these Jews and Israelites from these foreign nations that were coming mm -hmm. to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. That's why the gift of tongues was given. So let's go to Acts chapter 2, and I'll let you see it for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to go to Acts chapter 2. I'll let you read it. Hold on. Mm -hmm. And let's look at... Why don't you read verse 5, and then we'll, we'll keep going down. Okay. And um, let me see if I'm on mute, right? Mm -hmm. And they were filled with the five. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. All right, stop there. And, uh -huh. Who were these people who were dwelling in Jerusalem? Jews. Jews. Uh -huh. And where were they from? Every nation on the heaven. Right. <laughs> All over. So they so these so the, 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 the gift of tongues wasn't given to the to the disciples to communicate with the Gentiles. It was given right. to them to communicate with these Jews who were right. from all these nations around the world. Uh, and mm -hmm. remember, the gospel was supposed to begin at Jerusalem and then go out. So out of Zion must come forth mm -hmm. the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. It was to begin with the Jews and then spread out to the Gentiles. So right. the purpose of tongues wasn't originally, originally, originally to communicate with the Gentiles. It was to communicate with Jews. With the Jews. Now, after the Jews rejected uh, the message with the stoning of Stephen in 34 AD, then the gospel began to be preached to the Gentiles. Yes. But originally, the disciples had learned these different languages or had been given these different languages in order to communicate with other Jews. Right. I got it. So that's something about the gift of tongues that most people don't understand. Mm. All right, so now I'm going back to this. So the Jews of Paul's time spoke the languages of many Gentile nations because of the captivity. God would mm -hmm. speak to them in these languages, which were not understood by the Hebrews during the time of Isaiah 28. And, and in speaking to these, these, these Jews in, from these Gentile nations, God would be fulfilling the prophecy in Isaiah 28. So the prophecy was never about speaking to people in languages impossible and unintelligible for any human being to understand so as to bring about confusion because the passage says, yet for all that, they will not hear me. In other words, mm -hmm. the communication was not to confuse them. It was to bring them to repentance. Mm -hmm. it, was to, it was for them to hear the word of God, to listen to it. It was God making an appeal to them through these foreign languages. But even after that, they would not listen. This indicates that speech, the speech was intended to be understood, yes. but would stubbornly be refused. If tongues was gibberish, of course people wouldn't listen to it. But the passage indicates that God was hopeful or even expectant that they would hear, they would listen, and clearly indicating that he desired them to. Gibberish would not accomplish this. Languages would. Mm. That's how we know that the gift given to the disciples was not gibberish, speaking in some unknown language that only God can understand. It was languages that the people could understand. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. The purpose of tongues. Actually, let me see how many slides we have left because we might have to um, cut it and then, all right, maybe I'll, I'll stop here. And then I'll continue. I'll finish this up next week. Okay. Just in the interest of time. Uh, we're nearly done though. So that's, that's a good time. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll get into it next week and then we'll, we'll finish this up. So uh, we're on slide, um, what is it? Slide uh, 29. Yeah, right? it's a big um, topic. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. at least we know that from verses one to 21, there's no grounds whatsoever to justify interpreting that Paul Oh. was introducing to believers in a heavenly language that nobody ever knew. Mm -hmm. That's a mm -hmm. false interpretation. This passage was designed to teach that 
as they uh, were, were given the ability to speak known earthly languages, they were not to use it in contexts where nobody would understand it. Right. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Okay. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing and being able to come together to study your word. We pray that you will bless us and keep us throughout the week and open up our minds and understanding, Lord, as these are difficult subjects. We pray that you would be with us and um, bring us again at the appointed time next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let me stop the recording. Like uh, uh, have a nice, um, have a nice week. And um, I'm sorry that I was a bit distracted <laughs> from time to time. Uh, no worries. That's why I recorded it. Yeah. This way everybody can, uh, can get it, those who missed. So God bless. God bless. Take care. And Right. Bye.